Okay, let's uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study uh, this book, The J Curve, and how we can uh, learn to imitate you in dying and rising as Jesus did for us. We do pray that you would open our hearts and minds and give us uh, good questions, good thoughts to uh, better understand this material so we can take it in to our hearts and live it out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, so you guys enjoying the book, enjoying the material, getting a chance to read it. So what I'll do is I'll start out with a little bit of a review from uh, last week. And we talked about the fact that the J-curve, as Paul Miller describes it, you know, Jesus died and then Jesus rose again, is actually the normal shape of the Christian life. Now, this isn't something that we as, as Americans or Westerners understand very, very well because we don't like suffering, right? We, we think life should be a lot, of, a lot different than that. Um, but actually, understanding and looking at the J-curve helps us to uh, prepare for suffering, because life that's what life is like. And this is a normal pattern of life. It really is a normal Christian life, which reenacts uh, the dying and rising of Jesus. It helps us to neuter evil when evil comes into our lives. It helps us to neuter that, to... Uh, take the sting out of that. It also helps us in our hunt for hope because we have lives in which we uh, can be difficult and many things looking for hope. And Christian hope, of course, is not wishful thinking, as in you're hoping it will be sunny for the picnic tomorrow. Rather, Christian hope is really looking forward to the, looking forward to the fulfillment of God's promises. Does God promise you? We know that he fulfills his promises and that we look forward to, to the fulfillment of those promises. Uh, that's true biblical hope. So it's not just about coping. Uh, it helps us to deal with, uh, to avoid cynicism and bitterness, which happens to us or can happen to us, and especially for, for those who are not believers in, in Christ, who have a hope for the future. Uh, many times as we get older, we get more cynical, or can be more cynical and more bitter. It helps to engage life with joy, hope, and love, and it's very, very much countercultural. Uh, we then talked about the, uh, the issue of how we normally try to deal with life by the manager therapist paradigm. And can, can one of you guys tell me what, what that means, what that looks like? I guess nobody's talking about that right the manager and the therapist? What is their role? Think about uh, Paul Miller's trip to Disney with Kim. The manager wants to be the ticket person, provide solutions, and the therapist has something to do with emotion. He wants to, the, the, the uh, therapist wants to treat, right? So the man, you have the manager and the therapist, which is how modern culture wants to deal with uh, suffering when suffering comes into our lives. The manager wants to fix it, and the therapist naturally wants to treat it. So the things that um, uh, that were confronting Paul when he got back was the manager said, uh, "Well, you should have brought in help." You know, Paul, if you, if you had brought somebody who wanted to help you, that that would have been much easier. See, they're trying to fix Paul's problem. He was suffering, uh, trying to deal with Kim and, and the lines and, and Disney and, and all that went along with that. And the therapist is trying to treat it. Uh, and, and they'll come up with some helpful things like this. Um, don't you think that it would be better if Kim was in the home? And I have your best interest in heart, and they know what we do. But they don't really understand the dynamic of what Kim brings to the, to the Miller family. And so, uh, when you have a manager therapist outlook, uh, Paul Miller says you you miss love and the depth of love that goes on in the relationship between Ken and her sibling and Paul and Jill. And so when the manager and the therapist enters in, you miss love. And so Paul would say uh, that substitutionary love that happened when he went to Disney with Ken uh, was would have been lost. In other words, Paul suffered, and in a way, he, he dies as Jesus died in taking Kim, but who benefited from that? Jill. Jill, right? Jill was like, 
my goodness, you know, life was like amazing. And I was like, I don't have Kim. It was a, it was a wonderful young woman. And I'm not sure if you ever met Kim, but she's really a, a really very unique person. Uh, but Paul died, but Jill Rose, because now she was free for that week to not uh, have to, you know, worry that constant, be, it, even in, just in the back of your mind, that constant, I, I need to take care of Kim and Kim needs, needs my help. Um, and the other thing we repeat, we're doing a review from, from last week. Uh, you know, is it Jacob biblical? And we said that it, it was because of the way that, that Jesus' life, uh, the shape it took on. And there's three types of J curves. There's a love J curve in which you do a loving thing and you bring, you can bring suffering on, on yourself by doing that. Now the world, the world will look at that in a cynical way and they would say, no good deed goes unpunished. Okay, that's the cynicism that the world brings in that we were talking about. But Christians don't look at it that way. Sometimes love can bring suffering. I had a friend who was in Scotland with his wife on vacation, came upon a just happened motorcycle accident. The man was unconscious, wasn't breathing, gave a mouth to mouth resuscitation. He, he revived, saved his life. But by doing that, he got hit to pay to see. Okay, so that loving act for <coughs> um, the suffering, he got to see, which can be a serious, but now it's treatable, but he still had to get through the um, Repentance, Jacob, when we sin, that can bring suffering into our lives because of our own sin, naturally. And sometimes there's just suffering in a fallen world when you trip and you break your life. You know, that's, and that's something like that. And we talked about feelism, which uh, is what? What is feelism? Paul called that the central moral vision of our age. So I'm guided by how I feel. Got it by how you feel, right? Basically, it determines reality. Right. Follow right. your heart. <clears throat> so it becomes a central moral vision of our age. It becomes basically how we think about the world, how we respond to the world. Um, how does it or you make me feel? It's the moral grid through which we look at the world. And that's just how we, everything gets filtered through the feelings and uh, how I respond. And, and that basically is the structure that I look at them. Uh, Theism, Paul Miller says, makes faithfulness or biblical Hesed love. Have you guys read a loving life? A book of loving life? You know that Hesed love of re your people will be my people, your God will be my God. I don't care, I'm going with you. That stick to it faithfulness. It makes that impossible because if it's all based on feelings, then it's it, it gets too wishy washy and faithfulness gets gets weakened and, and it starts to leak out. So chapter two, we started talking about the substitutionary nature of love in which I take your place in <laughs> suffering. And uh, Matt showed the, uh, the video of Les Mis and his raw. Um, and, and what happened in that scene that he showed? It's early on in the book in the movie as well. Jean Valjean and the bishop. What happened there? What did the bishop do for Jean Valjean? Not only did he take him in to get him shelter, but he was repaid with having his uh, silver stolen. And then, on top of that, after the silver is put, I'll be returned because I gave that to him. Uh, so, <clears throat> I guess to add an insult to injury, uh, he, 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 he bore both manfully and, uh, and forgave Valjean with the promise with the, the Demand that Valjean turn his life around. That mm -hmm. really you know, penetrated his heart. Um, very powerful part of that. Very powerful story. It's very powerful. So he substituted his silver for Jean Valjean's life. But it wasn't only the silver, he had the housekeeper there who was, you know, what are you, what are you doing? Did you, you realize how much, how much value this silver has? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for this criminal? Mm -hmm. I mean, why, why would you do that? You know, so, it, it was a huge cost for the bishop and his household to give that sort of away so that Valjean, John Valjean could have his, his life back. He'd already gotten out of prison for how many years for still in the of bread, and it was ridiculous. You know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. But it wasn't only that. 
then the bishop said, oh, you forgot the candlesticks. Right, exactly. Why didn't you take the candlesticks? Yeah, yeah. And that is woven through the whole theme of the story right. of redemption mm -hmm. and what symbolism is in those candlesticks. Right. Yeah. Above so, and beyond, really, uh, yeah. the reformation. Exactly. So classic redemption story, he would, it just gives more and more and more grace and proper grace. So then we come up upon a verse um, in scripture um, that is, is interesting. I know when I first read this verse a long time ago, I found it kind of unusual. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 24. Uh, and it goes like this, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction. So when I grew up in the Catholic Church, which is, is very liberalistic, so there's a lot of works involved in, um, in terms of your salvation. Um, then when I became a believer, realizing that scripture teaches us by grace and faith alone. So when I read this verse, I'm like, it kind of clanged with me. You know, it was kind of like. What verse did you say that was? Chapter one. One, one, twenty-four. One, 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 Colossians one, twenty-four. So on the surface, uh, what unsettles us about this passage? That anything can be lacking. Right. Yeah. I mean, how is that even possible? If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, it says Christ died once for all. So that um, I'm getting a kind of a dissonance here, it seems, it seems in scripture. So what does Paul mean by that? I mean, scripture interprets scripture, so scripture can't be conflict with itself. So at least on the surface, I would think. Why why the seeming the seeming dissonance with this verse? Any thoughts? Well, let's look at it a, a little deeper. So Paul Miller then turns to his companion letter, uh, which is a letter to uh, to Philemon. Now uh as I look into this, there's actually four prison letters. Which is Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And Philemon is, is a letter that seems to have been sent along with the letter to the Colossians. Now, prison letters are not unusual. I mean, we have prison letters in modern times. He should find out for prison letters, right? Nelson Mandela wrote prison letters. So, prison letters is actually, it's one of those things which kind of helps to support the truth of scripture because this is something that people do when they're in prison. They write letters about, about their experience and, and to encourage other people outside of prison. <clears throat> and so he turns us to Philemon. And in in that one chapter letter to Philemon, it, it's about his slave, Onesimus. So Onesimus has been Philemon's slave and had run away from Philemon and found himself in the company of the Apostle Paul. We don't know how that happened, but it did. So they are under Paul's influence, and as this turns to Christ. So Paul is sending an essence back to Philemon with this letter in his hand. And I'll read this um, section from the book. And this is on page 27. And it starts almost towards the end of the first paragraph, starting on page 27. The gospel permeates Paul's assumptions as he makes his case to Philemon. Look at Paul's seemingly innocuous comment to Philemon about the Nesimus, the runaway slave. He says this, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. Paul suggests that Philemon gift Onesimus to Paul, quote, that he might serve me on your behalf. Just as Jesus died for us, Paul assumes Philemon will want Onesimus to serve on Philemon's behalf. This is an expensive assumption. A male slave could be valued as much as $150,000 in today's figures. 
For Paul, the Lydia's gospel trumps Philemon's property rights, according to Roman law, he owns Onesimus, and Roman justice. Onesimus ran away. Paul invites Philemon into a fellowship of Christ's suffering in an offhand way, sure that Philemon has the same perspective. Paul presumes Philemon considers substitutionary love normal. What he calls the DNA of Jesus has so shaped Paul that you can't imagine a Christian life that isn't radically shaped in the same way. Later in the letter, Paul offers to substitute himself for an essence. He says this, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, will write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Paul assumes that both he and Philemon would gladly substitute themselves for each other. It's how they do life. For that reason, Paul's request does not seem odd to him. So do you agree that with the Apostle Paul that the gift of a $150,000 slave is something that can be can and should be assumed between Christian brethren? Why or why not? What do you think? You don't think you can assume? Yeah. Well, you were shaking your head, so no. kind of picking on you. I'm <laughs> shaking <laughs> why does Because it's a great price. It's a great price that maybe in a lifetime you can't recover. Um, looking at it just number wise. Uh, good question. I mean, it seems like an enormous, it is an enormous amount of money. <clears throat> but a human being would cost that much. And I never realized this. Is before. But it's an enormous sum. So Paul seems to be assuming that uh, that's like not a big deal. I mean, he's assuming that, look, Philemon, you can't be here, but your slave ran away is here. So I'm going to I'm going to assume that in your place he's going to serve me because I'm in prison. Because back then in prison, it wasn't like today's prisons, right? You had to have somebody come and take care of your knees and bring you clothing and bring you food, and you were just kind of put in a cell and you had to fend for yourself. But Onesimus could do that in Philemon's place. He assumes that he's going to. Not just send them right back. I mean, do you think that's what do you think about it? Is Paul taking liberties with Philemon? In a certain sense, you know, the, the next verse in Philemon suggests maybe that Paul was aware that he was taking some steps that might be read like that, right? So um so right, Paul Paul says, uh, I wanted to go about Philemon to take your place in helping me while I'm in change for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. So I kind of get the impression that Paul knew that Philemon at his best would want to move in this direction. That's the DNA of the gospel. But he also knew that we're not always at our best. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So he's bringing it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, can I borrow your Rolls Royce to right. go, you know, what do they call that, with like Jeeps and stuff? Sure. Yeah. Off-roading. Off -roading, <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, Suzanne is That's right. Yeah. There you go, <laughs> That's her secret <laughs> hobby. You don't know that. No, I didn't know that. That's why I'm thinking of it. It's uh, kind of like the elephant in the room. You know, oh, by the way, I have your slaves. <laughs> you know, right, 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 yeah. Well, I think that uh, Steve, you said a good thing. You know, this um, in the book, Paul quotes Jimmy Agony. Uh, the DNA of Jesus is so shaped Paul that he can't imagine a Christian life that isn't radically shaped. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I thought about this, I realized. I mean, I, I don't think that I was too. Or presume that somebody would say yes to something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think we live in that kind of world, but, but I'm thinking that for Paul, I think Paul knew Philemon. Hmm. I can't imagine that he wouldn't have, he had a relationship with him and he knew him as a, as a fellow believer. I can't imagine that he would have requested this unless that was true. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. So it really depends how we, how we think about it. I think that, you know, for, for Paul, he's not, Assuming in the sense that he's going to take Philemon for granted. Hmm. Oh, of course you would. You know, like, I don't 
know you, but of course you're a Christian, so of course you shouldn't do that. I think he knows Philemon well. He knows Philemon's faith commitment. And so he assumes in the best sense. Like Doug and I, you know, are friends with the same small group for a long time. So my, my request of him for something is different than my request for, say, Doug, who I don't know quite a lot. Right? So when you think of it that way, it makes a lot more sense. Within the Christian community, that you have a, a, a deep friendship with somebody, it's not really assuming in a bad way or taking somebody for granted. It's really, well, it is the DNA of how they did life, but it also clashes with what, uh, you know, this is actually a question that Matt has brought up, you know, a question of 21st century Christian evangelicalism. Where our lives tend to be much more splintered and remote and separated and not as much in community. I, mean, I think the scriptures are usually good at doing that. But but generally speaking, we don't, you know, we're rugged individuals, right? We don't, that's not how we do life. That's not our DNA. Our DNA is putting your backpack and go to the mountains and build a cabin. And I was just reading a story about I got to do that in Alaska. Well, that's what we do, right? But that's not what Christians do in community. And they were in community. And so for him to ask for him to do that was part of their DNA. So it's it kind of shocking to us. Like, wow, that's right. Well, but for them, I don't think it was that. It was part of that substitutionary love. He's substituting Onesimus for Philemon, right? And in that way, he's filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Not in terms of the atonement, but in terms of substitutionary love. This is not an atonement statement. This is a substitutionary love statement. He's figuring that if, if Jesus were there in the flesh, he would be doing this. You know, he would, you know, yes. he would. So, but, you know, his spirit is within us. So he, he's not there physically. So we're going to take on, you know, as Christians, we take on. What Jesus would have willingly taken on, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, that really hits the nail on the head. Because, for example, it, as I was, I was trying to think of an example, my next door neighbor uh, is very ill and he needs to go to a radiology clinic. And uh, his ride falls through. So he calls me, right? And he says, Can you give me a ride? Well, this is my only day off. I work. It's more than a schedule. I have one day off a month. Mm -hmm. And that one day I have a whole list of things that I need to do. And he calls and says, I need a ride to the doctor. I wrote it my ride fell through. Can you can you and it's going to be more days in the morning? So if I say yes, that's substitutionary love because I'm putting aside all oh, I want you to do. Yeah. And Jesus can't be there, right? Jesus isn't there, I, but I am. And so I'm substituting myself. This isn't just the statement is initially clashing, but it's not a statement about the atonement and the lacking of anything in place death on the cross for our sins. Forgiveness. It's about me substituting I'm Christ, to, which is what you're saying. I'm being Christ to, to my neighbor and and being there instead of him. So but it's more than that, it's dying to what you wanted to get yes, done. Exactly right. And I think for us. That's the hardest thing, our own agenda. Right. Um, Paul Tripp talks a lot about this. Um, and it's our kingdom. You know, it was my kingdom that I wanted to organize my life for that one day off. And now it's it's blown to the wind, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's what Jesus says, take up your cross, right? So we're taking up our cross to die to ourselves to be Christ's for. The neighbor or Philemon to give up a message for Paul's trying to survive prison, literally survive prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just say uh, yes. Barry, the, the thing that strikes me about all this in in uh, in the book as we've read it is actually the line on the bottom of page twenty seven, which is exactly what we've been talking about. Just where he says um, he says that the apostle Paul invites Philemon into a fellowship of Christ's suffering. So, mm -hmm. right, that's that language from Philippians. Mm -hmm. And I just don't usually think of suffering as a kind of fellowship sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. fellowship is a good, happy, pleasant 
bonding, community, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And suffering yeah. doesn't usually have that kind of quality, mm -hmm. but it really seems as though for Paul, it does. Yes. Yeah. Better wake up. Well, there's a uh, there's here the an HBO series made twenty plus years ago. I think uh, Band of Brothers, and I don't know if anyone's seen that. Um, but they're, they're they're nobody willingly wants to go into the suffering together. But while they're in there, they come they come through it so much stronger together. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, my uh, my <laughs> my mom was asking, "What do you want to do for for, for Christmas this year?" Uh, you know, get together as a family, and and I was just reflecting on every year we you know sit down, the siblings get together, and we just talk and we eat great food and come away. And sometimes I don't really feel like, uh, and I'm get, I'm getting vulnerable here right now. Maybe I shouldn't be saying all this with my father. Right? <laughs> sometimes it feels like, you know, what what was that? So this year I asked, you know, can we go and like, do a project? Because he's building a house nearby, maybe suffer together a little bit and <laughs> come back and enjoy the fellowship all the more for having, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm not saying that because I have this like last of insight into life or anything, but it's probably checking the difference. I'll let you know next week. <laughs> <laughs> I think too about, you know, when someone in your small group suffers, what does that look like? How do we suffer with them? How do we mourn with them over, you know, their relationship broken or their body breaking down and getting a, a devastating uh, diagnosis? And that's happened, you know, that's happened in all of our small groups or a death. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we walk with one another in that way? Yeah, that's a great point because it's not just physical suffering like all in prison, right? It's it can be emotional suffering, it can be spiritual suffering, and how do we come alongside each other in all those things? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a great point. Okay. The first step that I think Peter and nailed it, and that is um, just to be there, mm -hmm. to be available. Uh, if you're not there, you can't. And and then uh, the Lord working through you to listen, you know. To, have compassion over the whole tree and in in that situation. Mm -hmm. But being there, I'm saying the obvious, but mm -hmm. but it's also interesting this year. Pardon? I, it's interesting that this year, at least for my family, some of the loving is accepting that some of the family can't be there. Mm -hmm. That they can't come. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And yeah. understanding and not being bitter yeah. or judgmental. Yeah. yeah. True. Mm -hmm. Cutting of grace. Yeah. Yeah. Because they probably feel bad that they can't be yeah, there too. Exactly. And you feel bad that they can't be there. Yeah. You're both so happy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, Ed the sheep. <laughs> Can somebody recount the story of Ed Sheep? I don't know why they call it Ed. They became a <laughs> She grew up later. Yeah. I want to take a stab at Ed the Sheep, the story. <clears throat> well, I'll tell the story for you. Um, Jill loves animals. She has several larger pets. She has some donkeys. She loves the donkey eyes, you know, they're just those donkey eyes, I guess. I don't know. Eyes. <laughs> um, there's kind of whatever you call them. Maybe somebody could explain that to me. Um, and so she had Ed the sheep, right? And um, they had storm coming up, it's going to be heavy snow, probably one of that 26 inch we had back in 1996, or whatever it was. Uh, so Jill's afraid that the sheep is going to succumb to the storm, right? So they call the farmer next door. He lives as long as he has a shelf, he's okay. And so that's not good enough. So Paul starts to give reasons why it's going to be okay, especially the fact that Paul just got in debt. Right? 
and Jill is anxious that Ed is going to succumb. Well, Ed is a sheep, right? And what do sheep have? Wool. Wool. He has a wool. A very, very thick wool coat on. And uh, not only is the wool insulating, but actually snow itself is surprisingly very good insulating when you're involved in a storm. Okay. So Jill wants Paul to do what? Go check, check on, on Ed. Go check on Ed. Check on the right. insulating power of snow. <laughs> <laughs> check on the insulating power of snow. And the insulating power of wool. And uh, so what's Paul doing at this point? Paul, can you check on Ed? And Jill is, you know, she's angry. She's concerned about the sheep. What's Paul thinking? You could go yourself. <laughs> you can say that, but it's probably what you say. That. <laughs> Not necessary. Yeah. Not necessary. Right. He's, he's, going to, he's ready to become the defense attorney, right? Right. Yeah. Your Honor, let the court hear that Ed is a sheep. He's got a thick wool coat. It's now insulating. He has a shelter, right? There's absolutely no reason, all the evidence showed no reason why I need to get out of bed and go out there and check on Ed. Okay, so when somebody's anxious, does logical arguments have any impact on them? No, it's the nature of anxiety, it goes against reason. You know, it's like anybody here have any unreasonable, what they would consider unreasonable fears. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not Brittany's nodding your head, yes, so I assume that there's a ready answer. <laughs> I crashed my first car on ice uh, like more than 10 years ago now, and whenever it's cold enough for there to be any ice, um, I stop. <laughs> <laughs> I get very anxious. Yeah. And he's not anxious at all, but much of the time, I won't say all the time. He will drive a lot slower than he thinks is necessary because I am very afraid. Now, sometimes he's like, it's fine. We can just keep it up. But if I say, oh, okay, slow down, he will usually slow down because I am anxious and he will sacrifice the logical thing, which is the road is fine mm -hmm. for my ability. Yeah. And that's that's substitutionary law. Right? And and how does how does Paul resolve the problem he has? Jill's anxious. What does Paul do? Check one air. Checks one air. Okay. So Paul uh, realizes that uh, Jill's anxiety is not going to be helped by his logical arguments. Whether it's Peter saying there's, there's not, nothing to worry about on the Ashland Road, or you know, trying to to uh, summarize, you know, why that's going to be okay, uh, because what's the real problem in this situation? And you mentioned it before. Is what's the problem with all sin? Where does all sin come from? So, so our hearts, right? It's a heart problem. It isn't that Paul doesn't love Jill or is he concerned that it's a form of discourse. He wants to stay in warm bed and not kind of deal with this anxiety of Jill's. But the real issue is her anxiety, and he substitutes himself in love for Jill to go out and check on, and then it puts her heart at ease, right? And then Jill can sleep and have a peaceful night. And it's a beautiful story. It really is a beautiful story, that way. And because um, it really takes the focus from us and our hearts by helping us to die to ourselves. That's why I was referring back to what you had said before. You know, die to our needs, our wants, and desires in order to you know, satisfy ourselves, and we clear ourselves in, in that place for someone else. So, uh, on to chapter three. Um, and this chapter is interesting. It introduces something called the failure of boasting part. <clears throat> And um, what Paul says is that this is something we want to do instead of the J group. Okay. Now the failure boasting chart is 
laughing and screaming because it's Christmas time. <laughs> And down here is failure. And here's success. Yeah. And we all want to be somewhere on this chart. And you know, we all want to be up here, right? Success. We don't want to be down here with failure. Um, so we boast. And boasting in terms of the failure boasting chart is not just bragging. It's Bragging with like rejoicing in your bragging. It's glorying in your bragging. It's like Eagles win the Super Bowl type of uh, in your heart bragging. We are the best of the whole NFL, right? And we have a parade. After the parade, we have guys get up and talk about how great we are. And it's like that's that's our hearts, you know, even though most of the time we're quiet and walking around. It seems like we're minding our business. Um, but Paul would say that this is the pre Jesus stuff, is, is when we brag and boast like this. So if we go to page um, 32, and uh, have a volunteer to read. Could you, the bottom of page 32, start on the bottom there. You're going to be reading this um, Philippians 3, 4 to 6, starting with circumcised on the eighth day and work your way up. Okay, just the material there from Philippians? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Paul's been talking about his confidence in the flesh, is what he said. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Wow. Man. Pretty radical, right? So, he's on this failure. Can you guys see? Mm -hmm. Failure busting chart, right? He's a uh, circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law um, of the people of Israel, God's chosen people. Okay. He's a tribe of Benjamin, right? You know, that's a warrior tribe. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Okay, not only that, he's a Pharisee. Okay, he's really, you know, stick with the law. He is a um, persecutor of the church. He's so radical about the law that he actually persecutes the church. And he's blameless. So, you know, it's interesting that all these things are given, right? He's born with those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like being born like into the royal family, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're a prince and you're the crown prince and you're the house of Windsor. And, 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 like, <laughs> like well, these are accidents of birth, right? It's like, but he, he glories in those things. And then we do that, we glory in something like we're not even responsible for. But then he adds to that by adding these things, right? And the blameless one was kind of on the gut by thing. It's like a pyramid, right? He's he's adding these, he has this, you know, has a foundation that he's building. And, it, so the, and the pyramid reminded me of, you know, when you're when you're reading your rice krispies and you're kind of like reading the back of the little block. Oh, the chocolate, the chocolate. Oh, what's on the bottom? Like water is on the bottom. Right? Yeah. Water's just way up to, you know, Danish or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he's like, he reaches the pinnacle. Blameless. Wow, can you imagine somebody actually saying that I'm blameless? But he did it. He really thought that. Like it's based on how you would keep the law. It, it, it wasn't, it was, maybe it was reasonable that you could say that. It's very objective. It's very objective. Right. Because you know there's so many, there's hundreds of laws, but you know what they are. And, and you can at least think that you're, um, that you're uh, keeping those. <clears throat> so Paul's, um, we don't, we don't quite get this completely as Westerners because Paul has grown up in what's called a shame honor culture. Mm -hmm. And we're not a shame honor culture. That means you can still be ashamed and you're still honored. But, but, you know, the West, especially the U.S., more of like a meritocracy, right? It's based on what you do, you get rewarded for what you do, not, not as much as like what you're, not like you're in the royal family, right? There's no royal family in the United States. Although we, we kind of like that. We like to watch the crown and things like that. Um, 
So then Paul encounters Christ and everything changes. So this is pages 34 and 35. And it says this. So we're starting the bottom page 34. Flesh is Paul's shorthand for our ancient allergy to God, our natural bent towards evil. The flesh is us on our own, independent of God, relentlessly promoting ourselves. This is what Paul is doing here. That's his flesh. Paul isn't dealing with the isolated sin of boasting. He openly he's of openly praising ourselves. He's dealing with the boasting self. Our secret quest for our own glory. We might never actually boast, but we might live our life dominated by the boast himself, critical, judgmental, quietly superior. You see, in the boast himself, praise due to God turns in on ourselves. And that's you know that's what we do. So Paul Miller writes. Our flesh reverses the two great commandments. Instead of loving others, we love ourselves, pride. Instead of loving God, we seek other gods, idolatry. So how do pride and idolatry affect the way we relate to others? That's a question for us. How does it affect how we relate to each other? Pride and idolatry. And how does idolatry influence just like a little bit easier, how you spend your time. What are some of our idols? Make a list of our idols. Time. Time. What else? Comfort. Comfort. They're both good. I need of those on my list. <laughs> Fun and comfort. Help. Help. That was a good one. Birth and family, right? Mm -hmm. And what else? 401k. 401k. Well, respect, approval. Okay. All those things. Education, right? Did you go to Harvard or did you go to what's the matter you? Clothes. Clothes make the man. We don't have that as much in our culture anymore. There's fashion and clothing is in the important. But it used to be. Um, neighborhood, where you live. Okay. Position in a company or in your profession. So there's a lot of uh, false gods which promise life, and they make us look good. Anybody ever here watch a <clears throat> series called House of Cards? I don't recommend watching it. I only ever watched wow. one episode, which my sons were watching when I came home from the office one day. What's the name? House of Cards. Okay. It's a political series, and Kevin Spacey is one of the main, plays one of the main characters. And as it turns out, it's a long and broad story, but <clears throat> he actually, by being very ruthless, he eventually becomes president of the United States. And the scene is like amazing that I witnessed on this show is uh, he's walking down one of the corridors of the White House and people are cheering him. And he actually gets to walk into the Oval Office for the first time and he just stands there at the desk like this. And he's just glorying in just having become president of the United States. And it's just, it's such a powerful scene because he's not only the most powerful person in the United States, he's probably in a sense the most powerful person in the world. <laughs> and it's just the glory of it is he's just basking in it. And, but that's how we all are in this first. Really, we're not that character, but it, it's very, very, um, yeah, it, it, it's very similar. Um, when you really think about it. So that's what pride and idolatry does to us. <clears throat> and so, um, can you describe a time when you were tempted to market yourself? And this is these chapters you many pulled marketing yourself here. Can you think of a time when you were tempted to market yourself? Friday night. 
resume. Perfect, a great example. Padding your, what do they call padding your resume? Anybody else? An annual review or something like that. Annual review. Observation. Yeah, right. Teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For lots of us, I think, in our profession, I mean, I'm a teacher, a college teacher, and I work with a lot of really smart people. And my job sort of to be as smart as they are. And I'm not. Smarter than they are, or appear smarter than they are. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Or if you can appear, even though you might not be, <clears throat> you've got a leg up on someone else. So academia can be very much you know, like that. My example is I was in, I'd only been in practice for ophthalmology for maybe a year or so, and a patient came in and uh, he needed cataract surgery. And uh, so I told him what the diagnosis was, what the procedure was to uh, solve the problem in cataract surgery. He needed surgery. And he said to me, How many of these have you done? Oh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Or> 25. <laughs> the guy down the street's done like a thousand, right? So, what's going through my mind? How can I work it myself to not have to go to the guy down the street? Because I want to be a successful surgeon as well someday, you know. So that temptation to, to boast, build myself up, make myself attractive to this patient, to the will say, okay, you yeah, I'll sign up. Yeah, okay, when can we do this? And that's the temptation that we all face all the time. And academia is a great example. Academia is, or any kind of professional kind of area where you want to be pretty much more than what you call a person. Yeah. So did you turn up the anesthesia then when he asked? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did he take it out? <clears throat> he did. And um, and what do you said, right? I don't have the experience of the other guy was down the street. So you know, well I'm trained and I didn't hear from my residency and yeah, trying to tell him why he should stay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna say, well now you but maybe you better go to the guy. Because <laughs> I'll never become the guy down the street. So but uh, anyway. Um, so Paul Miller had his had his own episode of um, really coming to grips, and spiritually it was very very challenging for him. In which, and this has happened to me as well, as I'm sure it's to everyone. Um, he was in a meeting, and they started talking to talking about uh, something in ministry, in which um, there was an idea that they wanted to take on acting, and it was his idea. And but what happened? They weren't giving him the credit. What was his or what did he want to say at that well, point? He wanted to say something in a in some kind of way that wouldn't look like he was exactly. like, you know, trying to get it in there. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And I've been tempted to do that too, you know. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, he, in his heart he's thinking, hey, that's my idea. How can I kind of make that known? You know? Well, when I first had this idea, and I was thinking about this, you know, <laughs> you know that's that's we were trying to do it in a way that's not right and not close to another. Um, but uh, you know, he found it very, very difficult to remain silent. So, so why, why is that? Why not? Why not just? What's the big deal? Why not just let that go? Why is it hard? Was like an injustice. You like an injustice, right? You think it is an injustice? Yeah, I do. <laughs> but, but, uh, but because Christ suffered injustice, we should be able to, as, okay. as well, through stoically, I guess, uh, I'm not very good with this, but, um, yeah, just kind of swallow the injustice and accept it. That's what we should do. <laughs> but why is it, why do you think it's a problem for, for, for Paul? Now maybe some people say yes, I'm just and uh, whatever. But for Paul, it was more than that. Why, why do you think that was true? And I'll read, let me read this, this little thing. He said, the meeting ended and my co-workers left. As the door closed, I was overwhelmed with a sense of despair and loneliness. Life no longer had any point. It felt like I was disappearing. I felt unbelievable, unbelievably empty. Why bother putting so much energy into this mission? Now that that's too much like more than that, you know. That's that's you know what what's driving Paul's work here? Why such a? It feels like a disappearing. 
Well, what is it about us that that would generate that kind of feeling? Probably trying to uh, latch latch our success or our measure of success onto onto some little fleeting credit like that, um, and not realizing in the moment that God sees all and that God will reward us duly and justly. Um, probably, you know, trying to kind of hang onto that little rocket ship or whatever that was that he. he I can't remember the story too well. Mm -hmm. um, he thought would bring him success and credit in his work. Oh, exactly. And he was so wound up and so caught up in his work and in the ministry that to not go recognize was like a death. Mm -hmm. right? It shows really how fragile the psyche is. <laughs> <laughs> people, people are really fragile. Exceeding. We are really fragile. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, is it such mm -hmm. a big thing? Just to let it go. Apparently, in this case, it was. But man, is that really? Like two weeks later, is that such a big deal? I mean, he was okay. lonely and felt. And yeah, his dad is the boss. Okay, what's behind that? You can psychoanalyze that. <laughs> oh, you can, you can think of, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, so it's kind of what you're seeing here. But he wants to be seen. But up here. So if he gets if he gets credit for the idea in his co-worker's opinion, he goes, mm -hmm. goes up the chart, right? And that's what he wants. He wants so he goes about that. And we talk about, you know, we're like reading the story and thinking, boy, Paul, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, but, <laughs> but, but, but that's me, right? I would do the same thing. I don't need like the approval of others. It's like yeah. your idol kind of thing. You know? yeah. 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 yeah, because you, you, you get to have this. Right? Yeah, you, want you get to do this. Get the approval from them that it is the actual right. um, idea is being implemented. Yeah. So Paul realized he was using God's work to elevate himself, mm -hmm. and uh, he needed to feed his the monster. Which was his flesh, and you know, he would be recognized. So, what turned things around for him was that he read um, John, from John chapter six, and uh, it, and I'll read that. Uh, I'll read that for you. Um, on page thirty-eight. He says, "Well, what was the source of my overwhelming? You know, he had he was meditating like, meditating on what happened is." Attending on John chapter 6. And then he said he felt an overwhelming hunger for Christ. And he asked this question, but what was the source of my overwhelming hunger for Christ? It seemingly, seemingly came out of the blue. And he says, faith. Faith grew out of an awareness of my emptiness. My faith shifted from my co-worker's approval to God's approval. Very simply, faith replaced the boast. If we constantly feed our addictions, we will miss the real truth. Notice how feeding on Christ reshaped and stabilized my feelings. When I wanted to boast, I felt neglected, overlooked, not appreciated. If I made those feelings absolute, that is feeling, that would have fed a creeping resentment and nourished a victim narrative. Realism doesn't understand that feelings emerge from the heart. If my heart is off, then my feelings will also be out of tune. So when I said no to my flesh, not only did those feelings, those old feelings disappear, but new feelings emerged, sadness and emptiness, which opened the door to a new life of the Christ. And there's two verses down below there. Whatever gain I, I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So he had this enormous hunger for Christ. He repented by faith, and, and his faith changed everything. In terms of his view of what happened in this situation in the boardroom, when they're talking about his idea, he wasn't getting credit for it. Um, so faith replaces the boast. And Paul realizes that all of this, all, all I had up there before, right? This certain side of the day, the John Benjamin, the Pharisee, that's all rubbish, all worthless, all nonsense. And that, that's a huge shift for me. Um, but it all, all comes through faith. So uh, Paul um, has embodied faith, 
In other words, he's made faith, his faith real. Um, he's put it into practice, which is, I think, what, what embodiment uh, is. And then later on in the, in the chapter, he talks about how the Reformation has been strong on sin and grace, but it's been weak on um, seeing and celebrating blood. Um, and I know from, well, Shirley works with Paul, and uh, know, she knows that he thought he was going to take a lot of flack for this because people, some people in the Reformed community hold on to that pretty closely about being on the form. So, but it was really kind of a, I thought it was a, a a good criticism, but not like in, in your face. But it's true. You know, how do we see and celebrate love? Um, how do we enlarge our vision of what it means to encompass beauty and love as well? So he talked about trying to get um, overcoming our cynical age and cynicism being seeing evil in others' motives. And uh, I really like the summary that he had here on page 40. He says here, in summary, seeing how our flesh works is oddly encouraging. A clear-eyed vision of how our idolatry and pride work together helps us to see how critical faith is to shifting our boast from ourselves to Christ. As we shall see, what we do instead of the J-curve with the flesh, for example, the very wisdom trait, helps us understand how the J-curve repeatedly unmasks and initiates the flesh's power by inverting the failure boosting chart is the ultimate flesh killer. And so, I mean, we want to we want to do this, and Jesus did this, and that's that's how these two are interconnected, and that's how we can think about that. Because here, this is all ultimately you get up. It's not success. It's actually rubbish. And then God will bring in, in Jesus' death, eventually he brings resurrection. And that's that's the only place you're gonna find that this isn't going to get you resurrection, this is resurrection. This is really how life really is. So any questions or any thoughts or comments? Thoughts? Seems like one is concretely the flesh. And the other side is completely the spirit. Yes. And the work of the Holy Spirit changes everything. Is that empowerment of the Holy Spirit in us enables us to see that those fleshly things are rubbish. And it's God's Holy Spirit that teaches us no, it's dying to ourselves, it's getting up in the middle of a blizzard and going out to check on Ed. Right. That's that's where there's life in the in that dying. And the beauty of that dying is loving someone greater than we love ourselves with a cost of you know taking your to-do list and you know putting that aside and moving on. That's the ultimate love, right? Yes. Oh well, yeah, exactly. And that's hard to do, it's hard to die, right? Yeah. So when Jesus says, take up your cross and, and, and die yourself, I mean, that, that's, I mean, it, it's a sentence you can almost quickly read over in the, in the gospel, but it's a radical thing. And it is the secret to you know, living that kind of a spiritual life. Or to live like Christ, who, who died for us, gave up everything. And that's part of what Christmas is about, right? Gives up the glory of heaven to become a child in danger. But then, and then dies eventually, and then they come to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we're called to that same, which is why this this is the Christian life. Because mm -hmm. we're following Christ and what he did. And so that, that's what it's about. But that's something that our culture is. I mean, I think every culture is always going to be like that. Isn't it? so quick. Any other? Thank you. That's great. Any other thoughts? And something Matt said last week stuck with me that we have to be careful not to be prideful in our sufferings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> comes at you every which way, doesn't it? It does. And mm -hmm. that, that, that's not, I don't, I'd imagine maybe the book will talk come up about that, but keep that in mind as well. Was it Martin Luther who spent hours in prayer 
uh, and then began to get prideful of his hours in prayer, and then spent another hour confessing his pride. <laughs> I heard that somewhere. I, I don't know if it's true. It will get you coming. What? Proud of your Isn't that? What? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's 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 like that's how twisted our hearts are. Yeah. Yeah. So, anybody else have anything? Great. Uh, so, thank you for sharing, and thanks for uh, all your really great insights. Um, Matt will be back next week. Um, Do we have Sunday school like the usual next week? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Well, Matt will be here, but we we will. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to recall one. I forgot about the one thing that was a sheet. When they went out the next morning, the cold hit the sheet. And they see it went lump. Okay, Mark, could you close this in front? Sure. Jesus, we praise you this morning and give you thanks because you did not consider equality with God something to be held on to tightly. But you became a servant, and because of that, you were exalted. I pray that you would give us here the ability to have joy as we share in the fellowship of suffering with you, so that we can attain to the resurrection of the dead as well. Thank you for our union with you. Thank you for your uh, just your willingness to uh, to be brought low, so that you can bring us up with you. We're grateful for that. Praise you, thank you, Amen.